Okay, good morning, everybody. Um, this is the video that uh, I told you I was going to make regarding the RPA. Uh, and these are the revisions that will become effective this month. Um, they're anticipating December 19th is the date that uh, we would be, they would be releasing this document with all the other new forms that are being released. Uh, so I'm going to just go through and run through the changes for you. Not a huge amount of changes, but uh, there are a few. Uh, paragraph E1 has to do with, it should be red here. It's not red. Um, I don't know why the copier didn't uh, switch that over. Uh, but um, uh, this is new language that is added, um, added back in. If you know, notice the last revision on the RPA, when they changed it so significantly, they removed and defaulted to a zero point situation. Um, apparently that created some issues and they've built back in the language we had previously, which allows you to designate the number of points uh, to be written into the contract. Um, as I said, this contract will become effective when they release it, which will be December 19th. That raises some questions and concerns as to, well, what happens um, if somebody submits an offer on the old version of the contract after the fact, um, let's take that by a case by case scenario, but certainly if we're three or four days after the 19th, which is when it's released, uh, and you receive a contract, please make sure that they are, it, it is the revised agreement, the revised contract. Um, if something was in the works, or if you've got a current pending deal between now and the 19th, obviously, um, you don't need to do anything to close the transaction. You can close on that previous contract. Uh, but uh, once we, certainly after the first of the year, make sure that uh, people are submitting offers on the appropriate contract um, because it can create some issues for you know, we could have some issues regarding coverage and uh, the information that's built into this contract uh, is effective and applicable as, as of when it was released. So we always want to be using the appropriate uh, current, current, uh, current document. Uh, page two, uh, item G3, new paragraph. And uh, this relates to the pending litigation against NAR uh, with regard to seller side commissions. And what CAR is doing is they are hedging their bet and they've added this information with some additional forms into the contract uh, pending the decision of the judge in the February time period. So the next time that these forms are revised are in June. It doesn't mean they can't revise in midstream, but that's when the, the, the normal time period is that it would be revised. This is a maybe if it's needed. If, if it turns out that in February uh, or March, uh, whenever the judge rules on this, and if NAR loses, uh, then you are, we are going to be faced with a situation where the offer of compensation for buyer's commissions will be removed from the MLS. And that's gonna require us handling things differently and utilizing this new form SPBB, which I will explain uh, on a separate uh, video. This video is just explaining the changes in the current RPA. Um, further down, uh, also in red here, uh, the language that was used here before, this has to do with the review of the documents um, uh, uh, and removal of contingencies and um, addressing uh, if something is delivered uh, or received after that time period. So, for example, let's say a TDS is delivered late, um, then the buyer gets the opportunity for five days. Well, the clarification is it's not um, uh, receipt, it is delivery. Everything is based on delivery in the contract. So um, that wording has just been changed. Paragraph M3 has to do with uh, tenant occupied properties and it's, and it's uh, um, making a requirement that the on any time that there is someone that has a tenant or in a, in a property or someone other than a seller uh, that they would check this box and they would include the tenant occupied topa form which is necessary because it contains information that would be related to uh, that tenancy someone remaining in the property 
estoppel, um, uh, leases, uh, uh, applications, those type of things, uh, that information that a buyer might need to access. Uh, paragraph N2, uh, again, has uh, changing the language from um, receipt to delivery. And then as we move on, uh, under the home warranty, uh, there is new language added here, chosen by buyer. So home warranty plan chosen by buyer. Coverage includes, but is not limited to. So... This puts the onus on the buyer uh, that they are going to choose the home warranty. We've had some issues where um, uh, a buyer's come back and said, well, I didn't choose this home protection plan. Well, the contract is specifically stating here that the buyer is choosing the home protection plan. So it's putting them on notice that that is the case. And you'll notice um, there was a change in the last purchase agreement where we took, we got rid of some of the purchase agreements. We combined everything into one. Uh, and then we used for these specific purposes, if it was manufactured home or probate, no longer was there a specific RPA for that or a, a pur purchase agreement for that. Uh, we used addendums. And so this is an area where you would have a property type addenda. Um, the, the change in this contract is they've added a new addendum uh, which is the mixed use purchase agreement. So if you have a property that is mixed use, commercial, say, and um, uh, residential, then you will utilize this addendum to specify those important items that would pertain to a mixed use property. And then um, I wanna talk a little bit about deposits. Um, it, it, we didn't emphasize in the last contract, but it, it, it's still the same. They haven't changed it. Um, that Sierra is trying to get us to stop telling people when or when they can't get their deposit back. Uh, and there's language in here that, that definitely talks and it's bold printed um, that, uh, uh, that talks about the retention of deposits. Um, the, the bold part of it specifically talks about um, uh, non-refundable deposits. There's no, just so you're aware, there's no such thing as a non-refundable deposit. Even if a deposit is released to a seller in a transaction, it could be recoverable by the buyer if they choose to take action. Um, deposits are governed by liquidated damages and the very specific law that is uh, that is built into that. And um, uh, there, there's also um, additional language. There's red bolt, bolt printed language regarding um, possible liability and remedies if a buyer fails to deliver the deposit. So um their liquidated damages is what you would refer to um and just be very careful with regard to what you're saying about deposits you can say that you know i i've said many times before that you know you're like you, you you can use that that you're likely or you're entitled by the contract um to uh, potentially get the deposit but until you actually come to an agreement with the other party or it's litigated by law, um, the deposit is going to remain in escrow. And, and oftentimes, sometimes uh, you're going to find that there is no agreement ever made. The money sits for a period of time and then it is sheeted to the state and nobody gets the money. So there are instances where buyers and sellers, neither party ends up getting the money. Just remember, there, no, there is not, no such thing as a um, non-refundable deposit. Paragraph seven uh, talks about occupancy and it refers to um, uh, if there is specific, uh, let's say a buyer is gonna occupy one of the units on a multiple unit property, um, that there are some requirements that the property be vacated or the, or excuse me, the unit be vacated. And there are some requirements on the buyer's side to notify the seller uh, within a, a, a certain time period, three days after acceptance, the seller give written notice of which unit the buyer intends to occupy. So there are some requirements on both sides. Just remember if it's a multi-unit property and um, the seller is gonna live in one of them that you would refer to this part of the contract to clarify that. Okay, uh, bottom of this page, 
there was uh, some language. Previous language just had buyer's review. So uh, um, stating that the contract is contingent upon the buyer's review of the seller's documents. Well, uh, there was. It's, it's not just about the review, it's approval. So uh, the, the contingency has to do with the buyer approving the seller's documents or approving that they're acceptable. And how do we do that? Well, we've done that. We do that through the removal of contingency. So um, it's not just about reviewing them. They, they actually have the right to review them and either approve or disapprove uh, those items. Uh, same thing here. Uh, uh, it's not red, but uh, under the condominium, uh, you can see here that uh, they also added the same language review and approval of the homeowner's documents. And then uh, further down, um, just some, again, language. Uh, you can see, you can't see it's red, but again, they changed instead of, of um, uh, instead of, sorry, drawing a blank. Instead of Where the heck is that? Paragraph I, uh, removal of contingency or cancellation, uh, just offers additional clarity. Um, and you can see down here, it's not read it out, um, but uh, it was receipt and that language was just to be consistent with the balance of the contract was delivery. So that is the change there. So obviously uh, if they have, uh, uh, additional documents, which which it's it's whatever's later, seventeen days or five days after the actual delivery of the document. Uh, paragraph nine B has to do with it includes more clarity. Um, there are, uh, for example, Nest uh, Nest stuff is included, uh, electronics that are related. Um, security systems, um, home automation, smart home features, those types of things are specified as specified as included in the in the sale. Um, they did redline a few items uh, talking about associated hardware, uh, meaning windows, shutters, associated hardware and, and rods, and then pool heaters were added in there. Apparently that wasn't included. Um, but just a reminder that if you are um, going to uh, have a seller that wants to retain their nest or any of those home automation features that they need to exclude those from the sale because they are automatically included uh, per the, the first revision of this of this agreement at the very bottom which you can't see it um, but uh, it's it's right here seller shall delist any devices so this is in red this is new language seller shall delist any devices from any personal accounts 
and shall cooperate with any transfer of services to buyer. Okay. And I would just recommend that um, uh, items, you, you may want to add to your utilities transfer if you have a utilities transfer list. Um, just a reminder that the uh, you know buyer needs to have or is allowed to have cooperation from the seller that they would um, cooperate with the transfer of those services. So if it's a nest system, something like that, they would take themselves out of it and then they would cooperate with the transfer of those services to that buyer. Okay, next page, uh, it's red. So it seems like every other page is doing uh, what it should. Uh, but uh, you can see here that there is uh, some new, there was a new, new language added to inspections, reports, and tests. So it's adding uh, tests in there, um, added the word report. And um, really what this is reaffirming is that the uh, paragraph Q, uh, 3Q is paying, it only determines who's paying for the inspections. And it, and it, um, um, uh, it basically says that any other work that's going to be done is uh, going to be as a result of a request for repair. Nothing else is being agreed to. Then additional red language, any reports in these paragraphs shall be delivered in the time specified in paragraph 3 and 1. So that is your normal uh, seller delivery time period. Uh, okay. Um, again, tying the language together in the matrix in the front of the contract. Um, a home warranty and plan, home, buyer, shall, buyer shall choose the home warranty and plan and any optional coverages. And it also goes on to say that the, it goes on to say that the seller will agree to pay a certain amount and that uh, any additional coverages that the, uh, the buyer might want would be at their cost. Just order changes, uh, lettering, lettering and order changes in um, this particular paragraph, nothing of significance. A beefed up uh, statutory on solar systems. Um, and it basically is talking about how if there's a solar system, there's a CAR, CAR form that would be used. And just to be safe, we don't have a lot of solar systems, but it could be in the future that we might have more and more. Um, but, um, you know, there's some questions that are asked with regard to what is the solar system, what capabilities or how much power does it have, uh, all that kind of stuff. And most people, quite frankly, aren't going to know that. And um, uh, in this particular instance, um, we're recommending that you refer to the solar agreement when it was installed and provide all that information for the buyer to review so that they have the information. If they don't have the contract, they say they don't have it, then tell them they need to go get it because there is going to be important information in there that the buyer needs to, uh, needs to know. And, um, uh, so that's, um, that's going to be something that, you know, in the future may be more important for us. Paragraph N, known material facts, nothing really has changed there other than it's giving um, the buyer uh, permission to contact the insurer if there is any previous um, uh, fire, excuse me, any insurance claims in the previous five years. Paragraph uh, 12B2 uh, has to do with fire insurance uh, and um, making sure that that is built into the contingencies uh, and, and it is part of the buyer's investigation. So it's additional language clarifying to a buyer that the investigation of whether or not the property is going to be insurable, uh, both with flood and fire insurance is part of that buyer's investigation. Paragraph 14, let's see here, Did I pass it? 14 time periods, uh, there is some red language, just the, the numbering has been reordered in that, so that's not something important for you to understand. Um, if we go to page 11 of 16, brokers and uh, compensation under the uh, 18A, 
Um, this again ties forward to the um, matrix talking about um, if the lawsuit uh, does does uh, go in the favor of the plaintiffs and NAR loses the lawsuit, which there is a possibility for that to happen. I'm going to send you a link to a 10 or 15 minute video that has Art Carter talking about it and giving you more specifics. Uh, so hopefully you will have reviewed that prior to, to uh, looking at this. But this language, again, is just on the potential that, that uh, NER would lose the lawsuit and we have to do things differently. We have to be using that SPBB form. And then we talked about this in the office meeting um, that I wasn't quite sure what any of this was about. But basically under paragraph 23, uh, there is a difference between an assignee and a nominee. Um, oftentimes, and, and, and it's going to be commercial guys mainly that use the word nominee. And the difference between a assignee or a nominee is that uh, the um, assignee is assuming the contract and, and the responsibilities under the contract. The nominee is not doing that. And so it's purely a definition. And what this paragraph uh, what, what this paragraph is doing is that if for some reason it slips through the cracks and a contract is accepted using nominee, it could potentially invalidate the agreement. And what this does is this protects against that. So um, uh, you don't need to worry too much about it unless uh, there is someone writing in the contract. It says John Doe or nominee or John Doe or assignee. Um, that would be a, a situation where you would have to refer, revert back to this paragraph. Um, there also is, just so you're aware, if there is an assignment of the contract, it does allow for the contract to be assigned, uh, and um, but it would require, if it's to a different entity other than owned by the current buyer, it would require the seller to approve uh, and, and consent to the assignment. Um, uh, and they can't do that. They can't withhold it unreasonably. Um, but if it, there is a restriction on how much time that the assignment can occur. So in the contract, it defaults to 17 days. Uh, if it goes past the 17 days, still could be assigned, but that creates problems with escrow and, and potential closing. So uh, that would be a situation where both the buyer and seller would have to come agree come to agreement that they are going to allow that assignment to occur. But for the first 17 days, uh, that is when it is designated that that assignment would be notified or memorialized, sorry. Okay, let's see here. Counting days, uh, okay, so this, all this basically is doing is defining what a legal holiday is. And a legal holiday, um, there could be you could get an argument if somebody was Jewish or they were Islamic or whatever. I mean, there's all kinds of different holidays uh, and they could specify that a specific date might be a holiday. Well, uh, the, the test or the rule of thumb, because we're in California, uh, we have to have a, a, a defined, um, uh, defined holiday schedule. And so if there is a date that the recorder title or escrow is not open, uh, then that would be considered a holiday by definition in this in this agreement. Um, it also specifies that unless otherwise agreed, buyer and seller agree to use electronic signatures. There has been some problems with that, um, but basically it's it's uh, it's it's notifying both the buyer and seller that they, that this is a this is an acceptable and this is the the way that uh, that that, that uh, um, uh, that the transaction is going to be uh, conducted. Okay. Uh, further on, um, this basically just states that uh, this is part of the arbitration of disputes paragraph. And you could have some nasty people that would continue to threaten litigation. Uh, this puts a stay, allows for a stay to um, that a party can't continue to threaten if mediation or arbitration is in place. 
So they can't keep threatening lawsuit. They can't can't keep threatening the other side um, because it's in the process and they've agreed to uh, they have agreed to do that. So it's just a, a safeguard against those nasty people. Okay, so on the acceptance page, um, this has to do with uh, properties that are in trust or that there is some other entity. So it's a representative capacity situation. Um, you're all familiar with the fact that you don't need to use the representative capacity uh, RCSD any longer if it's completed in this section. Um, when writing an offer, you may not be aware of the exact name. You'd be surprised uh, that a lot of buyers don't know what the name, the actual name of their trust is. This is an attempt to make the document more complete, make it more usable and easy for uh, the parties to use. And so they're asking if, if known, uh, then you would put the actual name of the trust in the, in the document. Um, in the event you don't know what it is, then you could put B to provided to escrow within three days of acceptance. So uh, that would be suggested language if, um, if they don't know what the exact name of it is. And then likewise with the seller, when the seller is doing the acceptance, uh, if they don't know what the actual entity, the name of the entity is, and quite frankly, the county records are not a reliable source for that, um, oftentimes that information is, is incorrect. But you can utilize the same language uh, to be provided to escrow within three days of acceptance, uh, which ties to when they're supposed to have the contract in to escrow anyway, which is three days. And then up to the last page, um, this is the agent signatures, um, and uh, this is an attempt to uh, identify designated electronic delivery. Um, this information that's in red needs to be completed. Um, you may not want to receive, uh, and you're not required to receive designated electronic de uh, delivery by text. Um, but if you want to specify where you want designated electronic delivery to be made, then check the email box and provide the appropriate email. Okay. Or if you want alternate, let's say you want it delivered to someone other than yourself, or you want it uh, to go to some other email, even though you're putting your email on the contract, uh, you can specify that. And once the document is delivered, excuse me, sent, to that designated electronic delivery, it is considered delivered. And that's when the time periods begin. So be careful what email address you're putting in there or put what, what telephone you're putting in there. Please do not use TCs uh, addresses to email addresses to utilize in this designated electronic delivery address. You as the agent are the agent. You should be receiving uh, that information. You should be receiving that um, that delivery. And then um, let's see here. So when you are, the other thing I would say to you is um, if you do deliver, let's say you have a certain person's email address in your email inbox and you deliver it to that email address. If that's not the email address that is specified on the contract. So let's say the buyer's agent puts in some other email than you commonly used for them uh, and you send it to that other email and you assume that, that that notice has been delivered. For example, let's say a demand to close escrow um, and you send it to that wrong email, the one that isn't specified on the contract, uh, you're doing it incorrectly and you could face a situation where that could give the other side additional time. So please make sure, <coughs> even if you've got someone who is very, you're very familiar with and you use and you communicate with them frequently, make sure you're double checking where that, that uh, designated email um, address is being sent to. And then uh, that's it. So those are the only changes to the RPA. What I will do is I will um, uh, be reviewing the other forms, uh, the SPBB, uh, in, in the event that uh, we have a situation where the judge rules against organized real estate, um, 
And uh, so look for that. But this, if you have any questions, uh, anything that was unclear on this, not really major changes, but I think it's important for you to know what the changes are that are uh, contained in the document. Let me know if you have any questions. Thanks very much.